First Kings chapter 20 tonight, and uh, as uh, we start a new series, that's a good way to end the one we just finished on gratitude. Um, and I was thinking as they were singing, um, first of all, I'm just glad to be in a church with so many gifted people. Um, one of the responsibilities of a pastor is just to try to channel that and tap into that. Um, I just found out today we have a couple more closet musicians that I am always, my ears perk up when I hear any inkling of that. But uh, to pastor a church where there's so much of that just naturally is uh, such a blessing. Um, Connor did a phenomenal job this morning. He's not here tonight, but uh, did a great job. And just, um, I just gave that, just ask him. Some of you are asking him to do that for college. No, I just asked him to do that just for this morning. So I mean, he spent some time and energy to uh, develop that and just grateful for the privilege to serve with you. And if you have a talent that I don't know about, I'll figure it out eventually. So um, just give me a little more time. First Kings chapter number 20 tonight. We're going to begin in verse number 38. And I will preface our study tonight. We're starting a new series. We're going to read one of the weirdest stories um, in Scripture and uh, some reasons for it that God uh, is clear on that we'll study tonight. But a very interesting story, and if you want to read some really strange narratives, uh, read through the book of Judges, read through the books of 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. There's some really bizarre things in them. Um, you ever heard the expression, truth is stranger than fiction? Um, that's so true, and uh, the Bible is no exception to that. Let's stand together if you're able to do so for a moment. 1st Kings chapter 20, and we're going to begin in verse 38 and read down through the balance of the chapter. 1 Kings chapter 20, and if you would please, verse 38. So the prophet departed and waited for the king. Um, this would be for Ahab, by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And just to set the context, we don't have time to read it, but in the previous verses, he had one of his fellow prophets hit him in the face to make him look like he was, wo he was wounded, but a self-inflicted wound. And now he is disguised with ashes, verse 39, as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and he said, thy servant went out into the midst of battle. Behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. Verse 40, he says to the king, and as thy servant was, notice this next word, busy here and, uh, here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said to him, so shall thy judgment be, thyself uh, hast decided it. And he hastened, took away the ashes from his face, and the king of Israel discerned that he was one of the prophets. And he said unto him, thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man, speaking of Ben-Hadad, that's referred to earlier, a heathen king, whom I appointed to utter destruction, Therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. We're starting a new series tonight looking at busyness, or busy versus godly, and debunking the, the, the concept that busyness is next to godliness. And tonight we want to begin by looking at the dangers of being busy. Busy danger. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privileges to be here tonight. Thank you for what you've done in our hearts this day. Lord, we, we miss today many that are out, and yet thank you, God, for preserving um, your church and the spirit and the purpose of today. Thank you, though, we were missing many today, that, Father, we had a lot of guests and new folks, Lord, from out of town as well as locals, Lord, seeking your will and your guidance, and pray, Father, that they have found that here today. And, Lord, as we now study your word, we pray you'd help us to confront us where, Lord, we're filling our schedules and our lives with insignificant things and Lord, to um, allow you to replace that with calm, with peace, with solitude, with significance that is derived less from what we're doing and more from our identity in Christ and our fellowship with you. Bless now the study be honored in its launching tonight as well as these subsequent weeks that we study. And we will thank you and praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, the other day someone posted uh, online a picture of uh, A1. How many of you are big A1 people? You got to have that on your steak. Uh, I used to be that, uh, that way, and then I just tasted a steak by itself, especially if it's not overcooked, and I've kind of moved away from that, but some of you are big A1. Now, I like that on some other things, but uh, not necessarily on a steak. But the other day, someone posted a picture 
don't know if you've ever looked at an A1 bottle long enough to kind of, sometimes I just like to read where something came from or figure out where it originated. The other day, they, someone had a picture, and on the top of it, it said um, A1 and the slogan and everything. But at the top, I never noticed before, it said established in 1862. Um, you know what was going on, right? And there was a caption I'll get to in just a moment. What was going on during the 1860s? Civil War, right? And somebody put this caption underneath that picture that said, quote, so in the middle of the Civil War, someone was like, you know what this country really needs is a good steak sauce. (laughs) Uh, For the record, because I did a little more research, I think it actually was invented by a Brit, by an Englishman, not by an American. But I thought that was just funny, Think visualizing some guy sitting there thinking, you know what, I'm going to solve the world's problems by inventing something to put on your steak. Um, All joking aside, I think we've lost the ability to savor the simple things of life. Um, What previous generations saw as significant and valuable, just stopping, savoring, adding to a moment something special, we see as um, it just wastes time. And so I want to push back against that mindset that's just part of our culture today, and specifically push back against the busyness is next to godliness, uh, false uh, teaching that I think has often crept into our ranks as believers. Now, the subtitle to our series, you'll notice... I think it's in your bulletin, uh, possibly not, but the subtitle to our series is How to Slow Down for God. And I will tell you, until you slow down, you're against God in many ways. To be for God is to have more margin, um, is to have more uh, moments of gap and rest and renewal, and I just want to encourage you to think and consider where those applications would be made. Now, the text that we have before us tonight, um, I don't believe was originally written Um, to necessarily direct uh, exclusively in the application we're going to study tonight, but there's some principles derived from the life of Ahab that I think serve as warning when we become busy, but we're not being godly. And I hope you'll see in your heart and life tendencies that we see in the life of this king, uh, King Ahab. Uh, One author said this um, in reference to this passage. He said the line in verse 40 strikes me as a perfect description from our age. We're here and there and everywhere. We're distracted. We're preoccupied. We cannot focus on the task in front of us. And so may we tonight be willing to focus, to hone in on what would please and honor the Lord. Now, tonight we're going to study about danger, the dangers of busyness. And I just want to caution you, the dangers are not just physical. In fact, the primary ones are spiritual. Um, busyness is very deceptive. Um, and if we're not careful, we're not even aware of the dangers, the lethal threats Uh, that are a part of an overly taxed and extended life. So the question now is, how do we become more perceptive to the intangible threats um, that are a part of a busy or overly full schedule? I'm pulling a hair out of my coat, if you're wondering. Um, I have a dear wife and hair everywhere. That's something I hadn't known before I was married. Sorry, I got off topic there. I'm like, what is that? Um, But I love my wife and I love her hair, so I keep it with me all the time. Let's talk about tonight three exposed dangers that I think if you'll be aware of them, it will uh, help you be more cautious with your scheduling. Number one, first of all, this is the first danger of being overly busy. Busyness can dull our discernment. Busyness can dull our discernment. Um, We've been in about a seven to eight week crazy schedule. The staff guys, the deacons could testify to this, and many of you that have been helping with the renovation of our phase one. Um, I... (laughs) I have to confess to you tonight, in prep for this series, God has been convicting me. I, in the last eight weeks, I've not had a full day off, and I'll admit that to you tonight. And what, what led to this study was some of the things I see in my own heart and life. And we've been busy, and I know you have seasons like that. Um, but in this area of discernment, this past Monday, I was in my garage. It was dark, which means it had to be rather late. I think it was probably about 1030 I was just trying to put some stuff away. I don't know if my fan, I haven't talked to my wife about it, but I was trying to move some things, and I just fell down. The problem was I fell down with all kinds of tools and stuff under me. You never fall where there's like soft carpet to just land and gracefully bounce up. It's always over stuff that could impale you. And I'm just laying over. I had a pressure washer and um, my mower and some other tools all there, and I'm just laying there thinking, I, I, well, how did I get here? Have you ever had that? You just get so tired, you lose your edge, you lose your discernment. Um, that's true also on a spiritual level, and we see that in the story that we're reading tonight. Go, if you will, back to verse 38, and you will notice that the king, this king Ahab, 
was out of step with what was going on around him. Notice it says in verse 38, and he disguised himself with ashes, and the king then passes by, hears this man's story, and does not know who he is. And so we see there is a dullness that comes to our sense of discernment when we're overly busy. All right, jot down two things underneath of that that happen in the area of dullness. Number one, dulled senses. Dulled senses. Playing the part of a wounded soldier, <laughs> the prophet waits by the roadside. King Ahab comes, uh, and the king is unable to discern what is going on. He is deceived by the garb and presentation of this prophet. Um, key statement tonight, overly taxed senses often lose their ability to process the important nuances or details in which lurks heart-level threats. You know this, don't you? That a lot of times the things that most threaten you is just one little thing. Choosing between one little thing that's option A and just a little change that's option B. And that little change is everything. And if we're not aware as we parent, as we work, as we minister, we miss out on those small things because we're overextended. I was reading of a lady who was trying to assimilate into American culture. And uh, after a few months, as she observed Americans and tried to reflect the same language and expressions, she began to inter introduce herself as busy. Um, she would say her name and she would say, I am busy. Because she got so used to hearing Americans say that, that to her, that was just part of how you identify yourself. I am so-and-so, I am busy. But we're known for that. We're known for busyness. And often as we overextend ourselves, we're missing out on things that we should be discerning. All right, quickly, hold your place there in 1 Kings. Can I give you a New Testament example of that? Mark, if you would go there, chapter 4. Just a quick sidebar uh, to the study tonight of how busyness can dull our senses. Mark chapter 4 and verse 19. And I specifically want to caution you in the area of the Word of God, that often you can lose a sensitivity to the Word of God. It's conviction, um, it's confrontation, it's encouragement when you're overextended um, in your schedule and in your responsibilities. Mark chapter 4, and if you would please, verse 19. All right, now, before we study these two things, what the pastor is not saying tonight is you should stop doing things in the church or stop doing things in your family. We're talking about the optional things, the things that often we just do as a result of our culture. Um, that's the thrust of our study tonight. Look, if you will, verse 19 that speaks to this. And the cares, the parable here is of the sower and the seed, and the most important part of the story is the soil as far as its application. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. I think there are two sources of dullness in our lives in the sense area, and we're spending just a little bit more time on this section for good reason. First of all, we're dulled by the cares of this world. We are dulled, our senses are dulled by the cares of this world. An authorized reading said this, quote, For most of us, it isn't heresy or rank apostasy that will derail our profession of faith. It is simply the day-to-day -day worries and maintenance of life. Right now, you have things you've got to get done this week, don't you? And if you're not careful like me, that already begins to cast a shadow over Sunday evening as we gather around the Word of God. And my concern is, shouldn't we maybe address some of those things and push back against those things? The cares of this world, not necessarily carnality, just the day-to-day -day grind can choke out the Word of God. It is a dullness. It is a, a hardness where there should be a receptivity. All right, then notice also not only the cares of this world, but in verse 19, and the lust of other things entering in choke the Word and becometh unfruitful. I think riches and lust are also things that produce dullness, cares of this world, riches, and lust. It is not the possessions themselves that are blamed. The problem is when everything we do is to take care of those things, everything we do is to get more of those things. Where is there the most stress? Is it in some third world country? No, it's, it, it, it thrives where we are most affluent. Um, stress always runs with wealth. Stress always runs with the accumulation of things. Now, I want to give you a, a brief paragraph I read the other day that really challenged me as a pastor and as a believer. 
He said this, As much as we must pray against the devil and pray for the persecuted church, in Jesus' thinking, the greater threat to the gospel is sheer exhaustion. Busyness kills more churches than bullets. That's a key statement. That struck me. How many sermons are stripped of their power by lavish dinner preparations and professional football? Turn the, the knife there. How many moments of pain are wasted because we never sat still enough to learn from them? How many times of private and family worship have been crowded out by soccer and school projects? And then he makes this conclusion, we need to guard our hearts. The seed of God's Word won't grow to fruitfulness without pruning for rest, quiet, and calm. And so I'd encourage tonight to take that to, to heart and to ask God to remove the dullness by freeing up your schedule from unnecessary obligations. All right, there's a second dullness that comes. If you go back to our text in 1 Kings chapter number 20, and notice if you will now the end of verse 40. All right, so he creates this scenario. The king then at the end of verse 40 said, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hath decided it. Your busyness and your irresponsibility leads to judgment. And he hasted and took away the ashes from his face, and the king of Israel discerned he was one of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord to you, Ahab, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. Number two, not only does it dull our senses, it dulls our judgment. It dulls our judgment. Why are Christians justifying things that are wrong and excusing things um, that are right that they're not doing? How have we gotten to that point? We've gotten there because we have a dullness of judgment. What is right, we don't know for sure. We won't admit to ourselves and vice versa. What is wrong, we're unwilling to identify. So a sign the other day, um, I can't remember where it was, but it said this, quote, Stop the glorification of busy. Stop the glorification of busy. We have, in our judgment, busy is a good thing. In our judgment, uh, busyness is often a sign of a robust, vital uh, purpose in life, and we'll get to that more in just a moment. But there is a dullness of judgment. Ahab quickly assessed the guilt of the storyteller without acknowledging his own guilt. Now, just to give you a bit of backstory, God had told Ahab to kill Ben-Hadad. He was a heathen king. He was to wipe out the nation. And instead, he began to negotiate and to excuse why he would not obey the Lord. In fact, I believe he thought Ben-Hadad could help him. If he built an alliance, now they could do more together. And you see a desire in Ahab's heart not to obey God, but to get more done, to get more, to achieve more, to conquer more. As a result of that hunger, that insatiable desire for more, he walked away from what God had declared to be right. Um, key statement tonight. Busyness, without you realizing it, makes you a pragmatist. And what happens is you do what works even if it goes against God's plan. Busyness makes you a pragmatist. If it works... It's right. If it gets me ahead, who cares what price tag is, is, is attached to that? If it works, I'm going to do it. And Ahab was willing to justify it and his dullness of judgment because he thought he could get more done. And I'm telling you, when you drive and you drive and you drive, that pragmatism causes you to do that which is counter God's revealed will. And I think a lot of the disobedience in our ranks, in the ranks of our brethren and sisters in Christ, is not because of um, direct defiance, it's just, it's just busy pragmatism. And can I caution you tonight to be very careful to avoid that danger. Busy people can quickly pass judgment on others' failures, but are completely blind to their own disobedience and its subsequent consequences. And so ask God to reveal and expose that where you've become dull uh, in your judgment. All right, there's a second danger of busyness found now in verse 43. Would you go there? 1 Kings 20 again in verse 43. And the king of Israel, after hearing this, this dark utterance from the prophet, went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. All right, number two. Busyness, number two, can sour our joy. Busyness can sour our joy. And have you ever been on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the receiving end of road rage? Um, Maybe you've been on the giving end of road rage. Should we start there? Should we park there for a few minutes and preach against road rage? Um, the other day I read a study that said um, 
they found that commuters, those especially in like L.A. and places like that where they sit in traffic for hours, uh, commuters experience greater stress than fighter pilots and riot police. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, it, it, over time, every day, that, that pressure, and, and, and it sours our joy. Instead of being thankful we got a car and a nice road to drive on, we're stuck with all these people and this traffic, and it can really wear and grind down upon us. And so busyness can sour our joy. Notice two things that it sours here in the text. Number one, in verse, verse 43, jot this down, it soured attitudes. This busyness, this only concerned about the kingdom and getting things done and pushing things forward, uh, soured the attitude of Ahab. His disobedience, his overly extended commitments led to a sourness of attitude. And Ahab returns to Samaria, and language here seems to indicate not only is he frustrated with the prophet in the pronouncement, but he's even frustrated with himself. He just, he's just unsettled as he returns home. It sours joy. All right, now here's what I want to do for just a minute. Can I give you three, I think, attitudes um, that we often have that really busyness twists? Can you jot down these three things? I think these will help you to identify where busyness is affecting you on an attitude level. First of all, jot down anxiety. And we studied this, I guess, maybe a year or two ago. But what is anxiety? It is this, over-busy vigilance. I'm going to talk through these three very quickly. When you're overly busy, what should be vigilance? That's, that's, remember we talked about, I think we talked about anxiety, that really any of those issues are just the fall twisting a God-given characteristic. And anxiety is an overly busy vigilance. You care about things, you're watching things, but when you become over busy, uh, overly busy, it produces anxiety. All right, a second one, jot this down, irritability. Irritability. Any of you struggle with that? Or just me? Am I the only one that struggles with irritability? All right, you're all smirking at me right now. You're irritated that I brought that up. Um, irritability, jot this down, is over busy sensitivity. There's nothing wrong with being sensitive. But when you're overly busy, it now produces irritability because you're sensitive to your own things and you're worn down already and then someone said that or did that to me and this irritability evidences an over busy sensitivity. All right, and then the third one, this one is the one I struggle with probably the most, uh, impatience. Impatience. And this would be over-busy planning. Impatience is over-busy planning. Good to plan, good to be prepared. But when you're overly busy, it's like, come on, let's get this done because I got something else to do. And you drive and you drive and you drive. And so anxiety over busy vigilance, irritability over busy sensitivity, impatience over busy planning. Um, the other day, someone said to me, they said, I'm rarely more focused than while I'm waiting on the five seconds needed to skip an ad on the Internet. Have you ever had that? It's like the countdown, and man, as soon as that, I'm moving on. Have you ever had that? that that's where I live. I just I don't want to waste my time, and you're always pushing in the attitude that comes with that. Um, may I encourage you tonight, if you have any task that you find you're unable to do with a joyful attitude, that's not a God-given task. I'm not saying you're unwilling. I'm saying you're unable. If you cannot do the, right, the action with the right attitude, something's wrong, and probably you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, many times we slip into that. We just go through the motions, and at least I'm here and doing my task. Um, in fact, I would submit to you to do a good thing with a bad attitude is worse than not doing it. You want to know why? Because that always ends in flames. You go long enough doing the right thing with the wrong attitude, and it, it just explodes. And so we need to be very careful with that. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you don't have joy, you're going to burn out. If you don't have joy, you cannot long-term sustain that action that God has called you to. And so soured attitudes is a byproduct of busyness. All right, secondly, if you will, now go to verse number one of chapter 21. And this is where the, the story really turns in a very dark uh, way. Look, if you will, now at chapter 21, and let's begin in verse uh, number one. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of the Samaria. So now we're talking about a neighbor of the king. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard. Um, the, 
uh, better vineyard than it, or if it seemed good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, <laughs> excuse me, the Lord forbid it that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed, turned his face, and would eat no bread. Number two, not only is there soured attitudes, but there are soured effects to your busyness. See, here's, here's what's most convicting. You want, to be miser- you want to be busy and miserable, I guess that's on you in some ways. You'll still answer for that. But do you know that when you're busy and you don't have joy, it also hurts others? It hurts them deeply. Uh, it wounds them deeply in a way that will often leave scars and wounds that are not easy to be healed. Um, the other day I heard a statement, very simple but so true. Hurry hinders ministry. Hurry hinders ministry. And may I say tonight, probably one of the heaviest lids on the potential of this church I observe, starting with yours truly, is that we're just overextended. We have divine appointments with people in our community, and we're, let's just be honest, we're too busy to stop, to be sensitive to the Spirit, to speak a word of encouragement or truth to them. We're too busy to give more time to the church. We're too busy to give more time to our families. We're just overextended. I know I'm preaching maybe at the choir a bit tonight, but we need to work at that and and free up time that we might be a minister to those God has called us to reach. The joyless joyless business um, uh, about uh, which Ahab was setting himself on would hurt not just himself, but his own family, the family of Naboth. In fact, they would lose their dad and their husband at the end of this story because of Ahab and his consumption with more, more, and more. By the way, when busyness goes after joy, it goes after everybody's joy. It, I found that anybody associated with a busy person, they're miserable as well. So maybe we be careful to think of how it's affecting others. Uh, someone I heard said this, quote, we become, when we're busy, overly so, a joyless wretch, snapping like a turtle, and as personally engaging as a cat. I thought that was a good description. We just, we're, we're not a help, we're not a blessing to anyone when we're overextended. So we need God to help us uh, in that area of application. If you tonight are too busy to do right by people, you're too busy. I don't know how else to say it. And I'm just telling you, anytime you have to choose between responsibilities or relationships, you know which to choose, don't you? Relationships. The responsibilities will be checked, the box will be checked by someone else someday, but you alone are a father, you alone are a mother, you alone have a a relational responsibility to someone as a pastor, as a church member, and so own the relationship. If you can squeeze in the responsibilities, praise the Lord. All right, thirdly, let's talk for a minute about the last danger, and this would be the most serious. Thirdly, busyness can rot our soul. Busyness can rot our soul. And we see that happening to Ahab in the narrative here as he pouts upon his bed in verse number 4. Let's go on to verse (coughs) 5. Verse 5, But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad? Thou eatest no bread. He goes on to bemoan the situation. Verse 7, Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Rise, eat bread, let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. The story goes on to talk about her plan and her attack and uh, Ahab's complicity complicity in it. And basically what they do is they kill Naboth to get his vineyard. Um, The rottenness of our soul. Um, Have you noticed the really crazy Oreo flavors that are out nowadays? Have you seen that? I mean, they just keep pushing the envelope. I don't know who's in charge of that, but whoever it is 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 at least creative. I don't know if I want to eat half of the options they give. But did you see the fireworks ones? You got those like, you know, the, the candy that like pops in your mouth. Some of you are going to go out tonight now for July 4th and get these, but you bite into it and then it just kind of sizzles in your mouth. And they have this big graphic of fireworks. I saw them the other day in the store. Um, sugar will rot you, won't it? Rot your teeth, rot you maybe in other ways as well. Uh, busyness does the same thing, but here's the difference. Business not only causes the rot, it covers it. It's a two-edged sword. 
So it rots us from the inside out as it carves us out on an attitude and a spirit level, but it also then disguises it because we just do more to ignore or to deny the fact that there's an issue within uh, in our soul. The hectic pace of life can make us physically and spiritually sick, but it is this physical or this spiritual deception that often we miss. All right, a couple of areas very quickly if you jot this down. Here are two ways that, that are rotten uh, to the core that often we miss. Number one, jot this down, rotten significance. And I would put significance in quotes um, in your notes tonight. Rotten significance. Um, basically, just so you understand the story we just read, Naboth, it was his, his family vineyard. Um, and Ahab wanted to buy it. Ahab wanted to swap with him, and Naboth was committed to honoring his heritage and not selling off the family farm, if you will, this vineyard, and Ahab was unwilling to yield to the conviction and character of this man. Now, what's interesting is this. Right after he didn't take the life of Ben-Hadad, he was supposed to. He was supposed to squelch that kingdom and be the hand of God's judgment to them. And then being told by the prophet that eventually his own life would be taken and he would give, his own people would give their lives for the people that should have been taken from Bahadan's kingdom, that then he's worried about a vineyard. I just find that he's just been told he's going to die for what he did in the previous chapter. And the next verse, he's filling his life with, you know what, I'd like to own that vineyard. That's not unique to Ahab. We all do that, don't we? We fill our life with things, and often busyness is where we're looking for our significance. Um, the other day I was, you know, my first name is Harley, and the other day I, I'm always eyeing motorcycles. I've never owned one. I'm perfectly okay with that, I guess. Um, I love black leather, but I haven't had a reason to wear it yet, so I haven't, maybe that's what, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, behind a guy uh, on Milltown Road, and we're coming down the hill to, to three there, and he's sitting there, and He's just bebopping, you know, he's got a stereo going and he's just throttling, you know, his bike a little bit. And then as he takes off, you know, he's just enjoying his bike and all that means and letting everybody know around him, man, I got the nicest Harley you've ever seen and it's sweet to ride and all that. But he was riding the throttle. You know, a lot of us, we throttle up a lot just to feel like we matter. I got a lot going on. I got a lot of people that depend upon me. And really the issue is we don't know where to look for our significance. See, the presence of extreme busyness in our lives may point to deeper problems. We're people pleasers, we have restless ambition, or we have insecure meaninglessness. We, we need something to do to make us feel like we matter. Can I encourage you tonight? That's a scary place to be if that's where you live, because that's never ending. That means I have to keep doing instead of being. Uh, Christ and your identity in Him ought to be enough. Can I ask you tonight this question? If, what you, if you're what you do and who you depend upon were taken away, us guys, it's always where you work. What if that was taken from the men in the room or the ladies who work and derive some identity from that? Or who depends upon you? If that was gone, what's left? Do you still have significance? I think for many of us, we would, if we're honest, see ourselves more from a performance-based identity than who we are in Jesus Christ. One author said this in an article submitted to the New York Times several years ago called The Busy Trap. He said this, Busyness serves as a kind of existential reassurance, a hedge against emptiness. Obviously, your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you're so busy, completely booked, in demand every hour of the day. And I think a lot of this, that's where we are. If at least I got a lot going on, I matter when really it has to be more than that. Where is your significance derived from? If it's from your task, you're probably overextended tonight. But if it's from the relationships that you have with others, your relationship with Christ, that's going to create a healthy balance in your schedule and time. All right, the second one is found now. Go to verse 12. And this is the saddest part of the story of where overcommitting and making it about you and who you are Leads. Verse 12, they proclaimed a fast, set Naboth on high among the people, and there came in two men, children of Belial, that's an expression used in Scripture of evil, corrupt, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city, this is the man who refused to sell the vineyard, and stoned him with stones 
and he died. Secondly, rotten, not only significance, but rotten faithfulness. If you would jot that down, rotten faithfulness. Um, this kind of almost sounds like, I'm always struck by it. I was just reading through it the other day. Remember when the, Phar- the uh, Pharisees convinced Judas to betray the Lord? And then when he threw the gold down in front of them, they said, oh, that's blood money. And they began to impose laws on how to disperse those funds when th- they're violating so many others by, by crucifying Jesus Christ. Their selective faithfulness. And here we see the same thing. Here is Jezebel and Ahab putting on this facade of we're obeying God's law and he's he's blasphemed God and they're using this charade to justify um, their schedule, their priorities. I think for many of us, we excuse our busyness with the label of faithfulness. Um, A lot of times have people in in some of the room and we have done some of the things that have been suggested, but I always get a bit nervous when people say, Pastor, why don't we start or why don't we add? Um, one of the things that we've tried to do as a church, and maybe you see this, maybe you don't, but now that it's mentioned, maybe you observe it, we are committed to staying simple, to saying, trying to stay on task. Um, starting things just to start things, um, I think often convolutes our mission. If it doesn't involve helping with winning souls, training disciples, worshiping God, impacting our families, we don't need to do it. And we've really tried to be careful with that, and I hope you observe that in our church. We don't add a lot of things during the week. We try to be very intentional. We have some outreach things and discipleship options, but it needs to be simple. And I think as a church, we need to be very careful not to keep adding under the banner of we're just trying to be faithful and just do more. In reality, we're scheduling God right out of and His priorities right out of our purpose. Busyness does not mean you are faithful or fruitful. It just means you're busy (laughs) like everybody else. Busyness by itself does not equate to faithfulness. And man, just say tonight, ultimately you will not be able to sustain a life that that elevates busyness over godliness. You 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 may think you're the exception, but you'll eventually lose that battle. You're going against God, how He's made you. You're going against His His design and purpose for you. Margin has to be a part of our lives in order to sustain what God has given us to do. One author said this, margin is the space between our load and our limits. Do you have that tonight? Do you have more to bring to bear than you used this last week? If you don't, you're not where you should be, and neither am I. There must be that margin. Um, And this may help motivate you to include margin in your life. This, This was probably the statement that most struck me tonight in our study. But this thought came to me, planning for margin means planning for the unplannable. Planning for margin means planning for the unplannable. That means when something unexpected, crisis comes up, I have the strength and ability to handle that with God's help. If I'm right on the edge all the time, something comes up, something unexpected that's difficult or challenging, I have no extra strength, no reserve to bring to bear on that situation. All right, now let's end with this story of Ahab and where his priorities being out of step with the Lord led him. 1 Kings 22, would you go there? And let's look at verse number 30. And I don't mean to be melodramatic tonight. I'm not saying you're going to die in a chariot someday like Ahab did if you don't get your schedule right. But I think there's some lessons here of how serious doing our own thing outside of God's thing uh, will hurt us. Um, And before we get to that, I wanted to show you a picture tonight Um, and I think I know who it is, but they made sure that we don't know for sure. Um, the other day, someone put this out on the piano in this lobby. Uh, we have our secret sister thing. See what they did? It's my wife's name there. But they cut out the letters like a good detective would do, you know, like you see it in the Dick Tracy was my growing up years. Where, but they cut them out, and then they had a nice card to my wife inside. Did you get that, Hyde, by the way? Yeah. But... That to me, and I just use this as an illustration. Thank you for being encouraging to my wife if you're, you're here tonight. I think I know who you are. But anyway, I'm trying to figure it out. But that to me speaks to something bigger than just, it's, to me, that says somebody has some time, doesn't it? Took the time to spend to put that all together. To me, that speaks to a healthy soul, that, to having some margin and some time to love on somebody and to do it in a very thoughtful and intentional way. And my question to you is this, do you have time to do stuff like that? 
Um, if you want to love on my wife or someone else, that's great. But do you have time to do stuff like that? I think a healthy soul has time to do that. Now, I want you to look at what happens when we don't follow God's plan or purpose in this area. 1 Kings chapter 22, and if you would please, verse number 30. All right, this is after Micaiah uh, has just said to the Israelite king that if he goes up with Jehoshaphat, he's going to die, all right? So he's been warned. And notice now verse 30, the flippancy of the king of Israel who says, who cares, I'm going to do my thing. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. All right, skip down, if you will, then to verse number 34. And I love the random, randomness of this and yet also God's sovereign hand in this. Verse 34, and a certain man drew a bow. So he pulls back his bow adventure. It's almost like he just, he doesn't even aim. He just pulls it back and lets it fly in the midst of battle. And smote, this arrow smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he saith unto the driver of his chariot, turn thine hand and carry me out of the host for I am wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even, and the blood ran out of the wound in the midst of the chariot. What ultimately happened to Ahab is he tried to avoid God's confrontation in his life, and he lost that battle, didn't he? He did his thing. He did as much of his thing as he wanted, and as a result, it cost him dearly. It cost those associated with him dearly as well. See, the greatest danger with busyness is that there are great dangers you don't even have time to think about. You're so busy, you're not thinking about the devil who's walking around as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. You have no time to consider your enemy. You have no uh, time to consider the defenses and the the convictions that, that hold you faithful and keep you true. You're not maintaining your soul. You're not maintaining your relationship with the Lord. And so may we tonight give more priority to that walk and that relationship with the Lord. All right, let me give you a couple questions and we're done. These would be some questions that you should ask. Number one, what does it say about me that I'm frequently overwhelmed? What does that say about me? Number two, what biblical promises am I not believing? Number three, what divine commands am I ignoring that I should obey? And then the last one, the opposite side, what self-imposed commands am I obeying that I should ignore? And that's probably the one we need to spend a lot of time on. What self-imposed commands am I obeying that I should ignore? Um, Socrates is known for a lot of quotes, many of them we would not agree with, but he is probably most known for the following statement, beware the barrenness of a busy life. Beware the barrenness of of a busy life. And I think someday when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, there's just a lot of stuff that just won't, it won't hold up to the scrutiny of God's observation. Your career doesn't matter ultimately. Um, how many tasks you get done this week, how many look and lean on you for to be the fearless leader you've come to think you are, it really, it, those things don't matter. They may be the context in which you demonstrate your identity in Christ, and your service to him, but it has to be about more. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 12 where you have the guy who had a demon taken out of him, and he didn't fill that void, and then it says after he cleaned the house that then in came a legion of demons. I think that's what a lot of us are doing. Um, We're cleaning something out, and we're we're so busy, we're not filling and saturating our soul with that which is righteous and in creeps. Uh, corruption, in creeps materialism, in creeps our pride and our significance in our work or whatever else we're involved in. As a result, the latter end is worse than the former. Here's the question as we finish. We allow God to sober you with the warnings that busyness, that is over busyness, dulls your discernment, sours your joy, and rottens your soul. And if you sense any of those symptoms in your life, don't don't make any excuses. Deal with it right now to move back in the direction God would have. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for where it's gentle and encouraging.